A bright band of light fell through the parlor door into the part of the shop behind the counter. It enabled Mr. Verloc to ascertain at a glance the number of silver coins in the till. There were but few, and for the first time since he opened his shop, he took a commercial survey of its value. This survey was unfavorable. He had gone into trade for no commercial reasons. He had been guided in the selection of this peculiar line of business by an instinctive leaning toward shady transactions where money is picked up easily. Moreover, it did not take him out of his own sphere, the sphere which is watched by the police. On the contrary, it gave him a publicly confessed standing in that sphere. And as Mr. Verloc had unconfessed relations which made him familiar with, yet careless of, the police, there was a distinct advantage in such a situation. But as a means of livelihood, it was by itself insufficient. He took the cash box out of the drawer, and turning to leave the shop, became aware that Stevie was still downstairs. What on earth is he doing there? Mr. Verloc asked himself. What's the meaning of these antics? He looked dubiously at his brother-in-law, but he did not ask him for information. Mr. Verloc's intercourse with Stevie was limited to the casual mutter of a morning after breakfast, my boots, and even that was more a communication at large of a need than a direct order or request. Mr. Verloc perceived with some surprise that he did not know really what to say to Stevie. He stood still in the middle of the parlor and looked into the kitchen in silence. Nor yet did he know what would happen if he did say anything, and this appeared very queer to Mr. Verloc in view of the fact borne upon him suddenly that he had to provide for this fellow too. He had never given a moment's thought till then to that aspect of Stevie's existence. Positively, he did not know how to speak to the lad. He watched him gesticulating and murmuring in the kitchen. Stevie prowled round the table like an excited animal in a cage. A tentative, hadn't you better go to bed now, produced no effect whatever, and Mr. Verloc, abandoning the stony contemplation of his brother-in-law's behavior, crossed the parlor wearily, cash box in hand. The cause of the general lassitude he felt while climbing the stairs being purely mental, he became alarmed by its inexplicable character. He hoped he was not sickening for anything. He stopped on the dark landing to examine his sensations, but a slight and continuous sound of snoring pervading the obscurity interfered with their clearness. The sound came from his mother-in-law's room, Another one to provide for, he thought, and on this thought walked into the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc had fallen asleep with the lamp, no gas was laid upstairs, turned up full on the table by the side of the bed. The light thrown down by the shade fell dazzlingly on the white pillow, sunk by the weight of her head, reposing with closed eyes, and dark hair done up in several plates for the night. She woke up with the sound of her name in her ears and saw her husband standing over her. Winnie, Winnie. At first she did not stir, lying very quiet and looking at the cash box in Mr. Verloc's hand. But when she understood that her brother was capering all over the place downstairs, she swung out in one sudden movement onto the edge of the bed. Her bare feet, as if poked through the bottom of an unadorned, sleeved calico sack buttoned tightly at neck and wrists, felt over the rug for the slippers, while she looked upward into her husband's face. I don't know how to manage him, Mr. Verloc explained peevishly. Won't do to leave him downstairs alone with the lights. She said nothing glided across the room swiftly, and the door closed upon her white form. Mr. Verloc deposited the cash box on the night table and began the operation of undressing by flinging his overcoat onto a distant chair. His coat and waistcoat followed. He walked about the room in his stockinged feet, and his burly figure, with the hands worrying nervously at his throat, passed and repassed across the long strip of looking-glass in the door 
of his wife's wardrobe. Then, after slipping his braces off his shoulders, he pulled up violently the Venetian blind and leaned his forehead against the cold window pane. A fragile film of glass stretched between him and the enormity of cold, black, wet, muddy, inhospitable accumulation of bricks, slates, and stones, things in themselves unlovely and unfriendly to man. Mr. Verloc felt the latent unfriendliness of all out of doors, with a force approaching to positive bodily anguish. There is no occupation that fails a man more completely than that of a secret agent of police. It's like your horse suddenly falling dead under you in the midst of an uninhabited and thirsty plain. The comparison occurred to Mr. Verloc because he had sat astride various army horses in his time, and had now the sensation of an incipient fall. The prospect was as black as the window pane against which he was leaning his forehead. And suddenly the face of Mr. Vladimir, clean-shaven and witty, appeared enhaloed in the glow of its rosy complexion like a sort of pink seal impressed on the fatal darkness. This luminous and mutilated vision was so ghastly physically that Mr. Verloc started away from the window, letting down the Venetian blind with a great rattle. Discomposed and speechless with the apprehension of more such visions, he beheld his wife re-enter the room and get into bed in a calm, business-like manner, which made him feel hopelessly lonely in the world. Mrs. Verloc expressed her surprise at seeing him up yet. I don't feel very well, he muttered, passing his hands over his moist brow. Giddiness? Yes, not at all well. Mrs. Verloc, with all the placidity of an experienced wife, expressed a confident opinion as to the cause and suggested the usual remedies but her husband, rooted in the middle of the room, shook his lowered head sadly. "'You'll catch cold standing there,' she observed. Mr. Verloc made an effort, finished undressing, and got into bed. Down below in the quiet, narrow street, measured footsteps approached the house, then died away, unhurried and firm, as if the passerby had started to pace out all eternity— from gas lamp to gas lamp in a night without end, and the drowsy ticking of the old clock on the landing became distinctly audible in the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc, on her back and staring at the ceiling, made a remark. Taking's very small today. Mr. Verloc, in the same position, cleared his throat as if for an important statement, but merely inquired, did you turn off the gas downstairs? Yes, I did, answered Mrs. Verloc conscientiously. That poor boy is in a very excited state tonight, she murmured, after a pause which lasted for three ticks of the clock. Mr. Verloc cared nothing for Stevie's excitement, but he felt horribly wakeful and dreaded facing the darkness and silence that would follow the extinguishing of the lamp. This dread led him to make the remark that Stevie had disregarded his suggestion to go to bed. Mrs. Verloc, falling into the trap, started to demonstrate at length to her husband that this was not impudence of any sort, but simply excitement. There was no young man of his age in London more willing and docile than Stephen, she affirmed, none more affectionate and ready to please and even useful as long as people did not upset his poor head. Mrs. Verloc, turning towards her recumbent husband, raised herself on her elbow and hung over him in her anxiety that he should believe Stevie to be a useful member of the family. That ardor of protecting compassion, exalted morbidly in her childhood by the misery of another child, tinged her sallow cheeks with a faint dusky blush, made her big eyes gleam under the dark lids. Mrs. Verloc then looked younger. She looked as young as Winnie used to look. 
and much more animated than the Winnie of the Belgravian mansion days had ever allowed herself to appear to gentlemen lodgers. Mr. Verloc's anxieties had prevented him from attaching any sense to what his wife was saying. It was as if her voice was talking on the other side of a very thick wall. It was her aspect that recalled him to himself. He appreciated this woman, and the sentiment of this appreciation, stirred by a display of something resembling emotion, only added another pang to his mental anguish. When her voice ceased, he moved uneasily and said, I haven't been feeling well for the last few days. He might have meant this as an opening to a complete confidence, but Mrs. Verloc laid her head on the pillow again and, staring upward, went on, That boy hears too much of what is talked about here. If I had known they were coming tonight, I would have seen to it that he went to bed at the same time I did. He was out of his mind with something he overheard about eating people's flesh and drinking blood. What's the good of talking like that? There was a note of indignant scorn in her voice. Mr. Verloc was fully responsive now. Ask Karl Junt, he growled savagely. Mrs. Verloc, with great decision, pronounced Karl Junt a disgusting old man. She declared openly her affection for Michaelis. Of the robust Ossipon, in whose presence she always felt uneasy, behind an attitude of stony reserve, she said nothing whatever. And continuing to talk of that brother, who had been for so many years an object of care and fears, he isn't fit to hear what's said here. He believes it's all true. He knows no better. He gets into his passions over it. Mr. Verloc made no comment. He glared at me as if he didn't know who I was when I went downstairs. His heart was going like a hammer. He can't help being excitable. I woke Mother up and asked her to sit with him till he went to sleep. It isn't his fault. He's no trouble when he's left alone. Mr. Verloc made no comment. I wish he had never been to school... Mrs. Verloc began again brusquely. He's always taking away those newspapers from the window to read. He gets a red face pouring over them. We don't get rid of a dozen numbers in a month. They only take up room in the front window. And Mr. Ossipon brings every week a pile of these F.P. tracts to sell at a halfpenny each. I wouldn't give a halfpenny for the whole lot. It's silly reading, that's what it is. There's no sale for it. The other day Stevie got hold of one, and there was a story in it of a German soldier officer tearing half off the ear of a recruit. And nothing was done to him for it. The brute. The story was enough, too, to make one's blood boil. But what's the use of printing things like that? We aren't German slaves here, thank God. It's not our business, is it? Mr. Verloc made no reply. I had to take the carving knife from the boy, Mrs. Verloc continued a little sleepily now. He was shouting and stamping and sobbing. He can't stand the notion of any cruelty. He would have stuck that officer like a pig if he had seen him there. It's true, too. Some people don't deserve much mercy. Mrs. Verloc's voice ceased and the expression of her motionless eyes became more and more contemplative and veiled during the long pause. Comfortable, dear? she asked in a faint, faraway voice. Shall I put out the light now? The dreary conviction that there was no sleep for him held Mr. Verloc mute and hopelessly inert in his fear of darkness. He made a great effort, Yes, put it out, he said at last in a hollow tone. Chapter 4 Most of the thirty or so little tables covered by red cloths with a white design stood ranged at right angles to the deep brown wainscoting of the underground hall. Bronze chandeliers with many globes depended from the low, slightly vaulted ceiling 
and the fresco paintings ran flat and dull all round the walls without windows, representing scenes of the chase and of outdoor revelry in medieval costumes. Varlets in green jerkins brandished hunting knives and raised on high tankards of foaming beer. Unless I am very much mistaken, you are the man who would know the inside of this confounded affair, said the robust Ossipon, leaning over, his elbows far out on the table and his feet tucked back completely under his chair. His eyes stared with wild eagerness. An upright, semi-grand piano near the door, flanked by two palms in pots, executed suddenly all by itself a valse tune with aggressive virtuosity. The din it raised was deafening. When it ceased, as abruptly as it had started, the bespectacled, dingy little man who faced Ossipon behind a heavy glass mug full of beer emitted calmly what had the sound of a general proposition. In principle, what one of us may or may not know as to any given fact can't be a matter for inquiry to the others. Certainly not, Comrade Ossipon agreed in a quiet undertone. In principle? With his big, florid face held between his hands, he continued to stare hard while the dingy little man in spectacles coolly took a drink of beer and stood the glass mug back on the table. His flat, large ears departed widely from the sides of his skull, which looked frail enough for Ossipon to crush between thumb and forefinger. The dome of the forehead seemed to rest on the rim of the spectacles. The flat cheeks of a greasy, unhealthy complexion were merely smudged by the miserable poverty of a thin, dark whisker. The lamentable inferiority of the whole physique was made ludicrous by the supremely self-confident bearing of the individual. His speech was curt, and he had a particularly impressive manner of keeping silent. Ossipon spoke again from between his hands in a mutter. Have you been out much today? No, I stayed in bed all the morning, answered the other. Why? Oh, nothing, said Ossipon, gazing earnestly and quivering inwardly with the desire to find out something, but obviously intimidated by the little man's overwhelming air of unconcern. When talking with this comrade, which happened but rarely, the big Ossipon suffered from a sense of moral and even physical insignificance. However, he ventured another question. Did you walk down here? No, omnibus, the little man answered readily enough. He lived far away in Islington in a small house down a shabby street littered with straw and dirty paper, where out of school hours a troop of assorted children ran and squabbled with a shrill, joyless, rowdy clamor. His single back room, remarkable for having an extremely large cupboard, he rented furnished from two elderly spinsters, dressmakers in a humble way, with a clientele of servant girls mostly. He had a heavy padlock put on the cupboard, but otherwise he was a model lodger, giving no trouble and requiring practically no attendance. His oddities were that he insisted on being present when his room was being swept, and that when he went out he locked his door and took the key away with him. Ossipon had a vision of these round, black-rimmed spectacles progressing along the streets on the top of an omnibus, their self-confident glitter falling here and there on the walls of houses, or lowered upon the heads of the unconscious stream of people on the pavements. The ghost of a sickly smile altered the set of Ossipon's thick lips at the thought of the walls nodding, of people running for life at the sight of those spectacles. If they had only known, what a panic, he murmured interrogatively. Been sitting long here? An hour or more, answered the other negligently and took a pull at the dark beer. 
All his movements, the way he grasped the mug, the act of drinking, the way he set the heavy glass down and folded his arms, had a firmness and assured precision which made the big and muscular Ossipon, leaning forward with staring eyes and protruding lips, look the picture of eager indecision. An hour, he said. Then it may be you haven't heard yet the news I've heard just now in the street. Have you? The little man shook his head negatively the least bit, but as he gave no indication of curiosity, Osipon ventured to add that he had heard it just outside the place. A newspaper boy had yelled the thing under his very nose, and not being prepared for anything of that sort, he was very much startled and upset. He had to come in there with a dry mouth. I never thought of finding you here he added, murmuring steadily, with his elbows planted on the table. I come here sometimes, said the other, preserving his provoking coolness of demeanor. It is wonderful that you, of all people, should have heard nothing of it, the big Ossipon continued. His eyelids snapped nervously upon the shining eyes. You, of all people, he repeated tentatively. This obvious restraint argued an incredible and inexplicable timidity of the big fellow before the calm little man, who again lifted the glass mug, drank, and put it down with brusque and assured movements. And that was all. Orsipuan, after waiting for something, word or sign, that did not come, made an effort to assume a sort of indifference. Do you he said, deadening his voice still more. Give your stuff to anybody who's up to asking you for it? My absolute rule is never to refuse anybody as long as I have a pinch by me, answered the little man with a decision. That's a principle, commented Ossipon. It's a principle. And you think it's sound? the large, round spectacles which gave a look of staring self-confidence to the sallow face, confronted Ossipon like sleepless, unwinking orbs flashing a cold fire. Perfectly, always, under every circumstance. What could stop me? Why should I not? Why should I think twice about it? Ossipon gasped, as it were, discreetly, do you mean to say you would hand it over to a tech if one came to ask you for your wares? The other smiled faintly. Let them come and try it on, and you will see, he said. They know me, but I know also every one of them. They won't come near me, not they. His thin, livid lips snapped together firmly. Ossipon began to argue. But they could send someone, rig a plant on you, don't you see? Get the stuff from you in that way, and then arrest you with the proof in their hands. Proof of what? Dealing in explosives without a license, perhaps? This was meant for a contemptuous jeer, though the expression of the thin, sickly face remained unchanged, and the utterance was negligent. I don't think there's one of them anxious to make that arrest. I don't think they could get one of them to apply for a warrant. I mean one of the best. Not one. Why? Orsipon asked. Because they know very well I take care never to part with the last handful of my wares. I've it always by me. He touched the breast of his coat lightly. In a thick glass flask, he added. So I have been told, said Ossipon with a shade of wonder in his voice. But I didn't know if they know, interrupted the little man crisply, leaning against the straight chair back, which rose higher than his fragile head. I shall never be arrested. The game isn't good enough for any policeman of them all. To deal with a man like me, you require sheer, naked, inglorious heroism. Again, his lips closed with a self-confident snap. Ossipon repressed a movement of impatience. Or recklessness, or simply ignorance, he retorted. 
They want only to get somebody for the job who does not know you carry enough stuff in your pocket to blow yourself and everything within 60 yards of you to pieces. I never affirmed I could not be eliminated, rejoined the other, but that wouldn't be an arrest. Moreover, it's not so easy as it looks. Bah, Ossipon contradicted. Don't be too sure of that. What's to prevent half a dozen of them jumping upon you from behind in the street? With your arms pinned to your sides, you could do nothing, could you? Yes, I could. I am seldom out in the streets after dark, said the little man impassively, and never very late. I walk always with my right hand closed round the India rubber ball which I have in my trouser pocket. The pressing of this ball actuates a detonator inside the flask I carry in my pocket. It's the principle of the pneumatic instantaneous shutter for a camera lens. The tube bleeds up. With a swift disclosing gesture, he gave Ossipon a glimpse of an India rubber tube resembling a slender brown worm issuing from the armhole of his waistcoat and plunging into the inner breast pocket of his jacket. His clothes of a nondescript brown mixture were threadbare and marked with stains, dusty in the folds with ragged buttonholes. The detonator is partly mechanical, partly chemical, he explained with casual condescension. It is instantaneous, of course, murmured Ossipan with a slight shudder. Far from it, confessed the other with a reluctance which seemed to twist his mouth dolorously. A full twenty seconds must elapse from the moment I press the ball till the explosion takes place. Whew, whistled Ossipon, completely appalled. Twenty seconds! Horrors! You mean to say that you could face that? I should go crazy. Wouldn't matter if you did. Of course, it's the weak point of this special system, which is only for my own use. The worst is that the manner of exploding is always the weak point with us. I am trying to invent a detonator that would adjust itself to all conditions of action, and even to unexpected changes of condition. A variable and yet perfectly precise mechanism, a really intelligent detonator. Twenty seconds muttered Ossipon again. Ugh! And then, with a slight turn of the head, the glitter of the spectacles seemed to gauge the size of the beer saloon in the basement of the renowned Silenus restaurant. Nobody in this room could hope to escape, was the verdict of that survey. Nor yet this couple going up the stairs now. The piano at the foot of the staircase clanged through a mazurka with brazen impetuosity, as though a vulgar and impudent ghost were showing off. The keys sank and rose mysteriously. Then all became still. For a moment Ossipon imagined the overlighted place changed into a dreadful black hole, belching horrible fumes choked with ghastly rubbish of smashed brickwork and mutilated corpses. He had such a distinct perception of ruin and death that he shuddered again. The other observed, with an air of calm sufficiency, in the last instance it is character alone that makes for one's safety, there are very few people in the world whose character is as well established as mine. I wonder how you managed it, growled Ossipon. Force of personality, said the other without raising his voice, and coming from the mouth of that obviously miserable organism, the assertion caused robust Ossipon to bite his lower lip. Force of personality he repeated with ostentatious calm. I have the means to make myself deadly, but that by itself, you understand, is absolutely nothing in the way of protection. What is effective is the belief that those people have in my will to use the means. That's their impression. It is absolute. Therefore, I am deadly. There are individuals of character amongst that lot, too, muttered Ossipon ominously. Possibly, 
but it is a matter of degree, obviously, since, for instance, I am not impressed by them, therefore they are inferior. They cannot be otherwise. Their character is built upon conventional morality. It leans on the social order. Mine stands free from everything artificial. They are bound in all sorts of conventions. They depend on life, which in this connection is a historical fact, surrounded by all sorts of restraints and considerations, a complex organized fact open to attack at every point, whereas I depend on death, which knows no restraint and cannot be attacked. My superiority is evident. This is a transcendental way of putting it, said Ossipon, watching the cold glitter of the round spectacles. I've heard Karl Jund say much the same thing not very long ago. Karl Jund, mumbled the other contemptuously, the delegate of the International Red Committee, has been a posturing shadow all his life. There are three of you delegates, aren't there? I won't define the other two, as you are one of them. But what you say means nothing. You are the worthy delegates for revolutionary propaganda, but the trouble is not only that you are as unable to think independently as any respectable grocer or journalist of them all, but that you have no character whatever. Orsipon could not restrain a start of indignation. But what do you want from us? he exclaimed in a deadened voice. What is it you are after yourself? A perfect detonator! was the peremptory answer. What are you making that face for? You see, you can't even bear the mention of something conclusive. I am not making a face, growled the annoyed Ossipon bearishly. You revolutionists, the other continued with leisurely self-confidence, are the slaves of the social convention, which is afraid of you. Slaves of it as much as the very police that stands up in the defense of that convention. Clearly you are, since you want to revolutionize it. It governs your thought, of course, and your action, too, and thus neither your thought nor your action can ever be conclusive. He paused, tranquil, with that air of close, endless silence, then almost immediately went on. You are not a bit better than the forces arrayed against you than the police, for instance. The other day I came suddenly upon Chief Inspector Heat at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. He looked at me very steadily, but I did not look at him. Why should I give him more than a glance? He was thinking of many things, of his superiors, of his reputation, of the law courts, of his salary, of newspapers, of a hundred things. But I was thinking of my perfect detonator only. He meant nothing to me. He was as insignificant as... I can't call to mind anything insignificant enough to compare him with. Except Karl Junt, perhaps. Like to like. The terrorist and the policeman both come from the same basket. Revolution, legality, counter-moves in the same game. Forms of idleness at bottom identical. He plays his little game, so do you propagandists. But I don't play. I work 14 hours a day and go hungry sometimes. My experiments cost money now and again, and then I must do without food for a day or two. You're looking at my beer. Yes, I have had two glasses already and shall have another presently. This is a little holiday, and I celebrate it alone. Why not? I've the grit to work alone, quite alone, absolutely alone. I've worked alone for years. Ossipon's face had turned dusky red. At the perfect detonator, eh? He sneered very low. Yes, retorted the other. It is a good definition. You couldn't find anything half so precise to define the nature of your activity with all your committees and delegations. It is I who am the true propagandist. We won't discuss that point, 
said Ossipon with an air of rising above personal considerations. I am afraid I'll have to spoil your holiday for you, though. There is a man blown up in Greenwich Park this morning. How do you know? They have been yelling the news in the streets since two o'clock. I bought the paper and just ran in here. Then I saw you sitting at this table. I've got it in my pocket now. He pulled the newspaper out. It was a good-sized, rosy sheet, as if flushed by the warmth of its own convictions, which were optimistic. He scanned the pages rapidly. Ah, here it is. Bomb in Greenwich Park. There isn't much so far. Half past eleven. Foggy morning. Effects of explosion felt as far as Romney Road and Park Place. Enormous hole in the ground under a tree filled with smashed roots and broken branches. All round fragments of a man's body blown to pieces. That's all. The rest's mere newspaper gop. No doubt a wicked attempt to blow up the observatory, they say. Hmm, that's hardly credible. He looked at the paper for a while longer in silence, then passed it to the other, who, after gazing abstractedly at the print, laid it down without comment. It was Ossipon who spoke first, still resentful. The fragments of only one man, you note. Ergo blew himself up. That spoils your day off for you, don't it? Were you expecting that sort of move? I hadn't the slightest idea, not the ghost of a notion of anything of the sort being planned to come off here, in this country. Under the present circumstances, it's nothing short of criminal. The little man lifted his thin black eyebrows with dispassionate scorn. Criminal? What is that? What is crime? What can be the meaning of such an assertion? How am I to express myself? One must use the current words, said Ossipon impatiently. The meaning of this assertion is that this business may affect our position very adversely in this country. Isn't that crime enough for you? I am convinced you have been giving away some of your stuff lately. Ossipon stared hard. The other, without flinching, lowered and raised his head slowly. You have, burst out the editor of the F.P. leaflets in an intense whisper. No. And are you really handing it over at large like this for the asking to the first fool that comes along? Just so. The condemned social order has not been built up on paper and ink, and I don't fancy that a combination of paper and ink will ever put an end to it, whatever you may think. Yes, I would give the stuff with both hands to every man, woman, or fool that likes to come along. I know what you are thinking about, but I am not taking my cue from the Red Committee. I would see you all hounded out of here, or arrested, or beheaded, for that matter, without turning a hair. What happens to us as individuals is not of the least consequence. He spoke carelessly, without heat, Almost without feeling, and Ossipon, secretly much affected, tried to copy this detachment. If the police here knew their business, they would shoot you full of holes with revolvers, or else try to sandbag you from behind in broad daylight. The little man seemed already to have considered that point of view in his dispassionate, self-confident manner. Yes, he assented with the utmost readiness. But for that, they would have to face their own institutions, do you see? That requires uncommon grit, grit of a special kind. Ossipon blinked. I fancy that's exactly what would happen to you if you were to set up your laboratory in the States. They don't stand on ceremony with their institutions there. I am not likely to go and see. Otherwise, your remark is just, admitted the other. They have more character over there, and their character is essentially anarchistic. Fertile ground for us, the States. Very good ground. 
the great republic has the root of the destructive matter in her. The collective temperament is lawless, excellent. They may shoot us down, but you are too transcendental for me, growled Ossipon with moody concern. Logical, protested the other. There are several kinds of logic. This is the enlightened kind. America is all right. It is this country that is dangerous with her idealistic conception of legality. The social spirit of this people is wrapped up in scrupulous prejudices, and that is fatal to our work. You talk of England being our only refuge. So much the worse. Capua. What do we want with refuges? Here you talk, print, plot, and do nothing. I dare say it's very convenient for such Karl Junts. He shrugged his shoulders slightly, then added with the same leisurely assurance, to break up the superstition and worship of legality should be our aim. Nothing would please me more than to see Inspector Heat and his likes take to shooting us down in broad daylight with the approval of the public. Half our battle would be won then. The disintegration of the old morality would have set in in its very temple. That is what you ought to aim at. But you revolutionists will never understand that. You plan the future. You lose yourselves in reveries of economical systems derived from what is. Whereas what's wanted is a clean sweep and a clear start for a new conception of life. That sort of future will take care of itself if you will only make room for it. Therefore, I would shovel my stuff in heaps at the corners of the streets if I had enough for that. And as I haven't, I do my best by perfecting a really dependable detonator. Ossipon, who had been mentally swimming in deep waters, seized upon his last word as if it were a saving plank. Yes, your detonators. I shouldn't wonder if it weren't one of your detonators that made a clean sweep of the man in the park. A shade of vexation darkened the determined, sallow face confronting Ossipon. My difficulty consists precisely in experimenting practically with the various kinds. They must be tried, after all. Besides, Ossipon interrupted, Who could that fellow be? I assure you that we in London had no knowledge. Couldn't you describe the person you gave the stuff to? The other turned his spectacles upon Ossipon like a pair of searchlights. Describe him, he repeated slowly. I don't think there can be the slightest objection now. I will describe him to you in one word. Verloc! Ossipon, whom curiosity had lifted a few inches off his seat, dropped back as if hit in the face. Verloc! Impossible! The self-possessed little man nodded slightly once. Yes, he's the person. You can't say that in this case I was giving my stuff to the first fool that came along. He was a prominent member of the group, as far as I understand. Yes said Ossipon, prominent. No, not exactly. He was the center for general intelligence and usually received comrades coming over here. More useful than important. Man of no ideas. Years ago, he used to speak at meetings in France, I believe. Not very well, though. He was trusted by such men as Latour, Moser, and all that old lot. The only talent he showed really was his ability to elude the attentions of the police somehow. Here, for instance, he did not seem to be looked after very closely. He was regularly married, you know. I suppose it's with her money that he started that shop. Seemed to make it pay, too. Ossipan paused abruptly, muttered to himself, I wonder what that woman will do now and fell into thought. The other waited with ostentatious indifference. His parentage was obscure, and he was generally known only by his nickname of Professor. 
His title to that designation consisted in his having been once assistant demonstrator in chemistry at some technical institute. He quarreled with the authorities upon a question of unfair treatment. Afterwards, he obtained a post in the laboratory of a manufactory of dyes. There, too, he had been treated with revolting injustice. His struggles, his privations, his hard work to raise himself in the social scale had filled him with such an exalted conviction of his merits that it was extremely difficult for the world to treat him with justice, the standard of that notion depending so much upon the patience of the individual.